Hi, this is Pratima and you are watching Planet Physiology. In first part of cardiac output, we have studied definitions, normal values, variations and measurement of cardiac output. If you have missed it, link for the same is provided in the description box below. What do you mean by regulation of cardiac output? It is the process by which cardiac output is maintained within the normal limits or it is altered to keep up with the changing demands of the body. For example, during exercise cardiac output must be elevated. So how is it elevated? That is nothing but regulation of cardiac output. We have already seen that cardiac output is the product of stroke volume and heart rate and hence Cardiac output is regulated either by changing the stroke volume or heart rate or both. Stroke volume is decided by preload, myocardial contractility and afterload, while heart rate is affected by various neural and hormonal factors. So let us begin with the factors which affect stroke volume and the first is preload. Preload is the load acting on the muscle before contraction begins. In case of ventricles, preload is end diastolic volume that is volume of blood present in the ventricles at the end of diastole. This decides the initial length of the ventricular muscles and according to the Frank Starling's law, within physiological limits, force of contraction is directly proportional to the initial length of the muscle fiber. The same is represented by the Starling's curve in the form of changes in the myocardial contractility and hence the stroke volume with respect to end diastolic volume. Let us see how Frank Starling's law explains increase in cardiac output due to increase in preload that is end diastolic volume. As end diastolic volume increases, ventricular muscles are stretched leading to increase in initial length of the muscle fibers. This increases myocardial contractility and hence the force of contraction leading to increase in stroke volume and cardiac output. So here the contractility changes due to changes in the initial length of the ventricular muscle fibers and hence this type of regulation is also called as heterometric regulation where Hetero means different or not same and metric is for major or length. So we have seen that end diastolic volume decides cardiac output. But who decides end diastolic volume or preload? Let us see. It is decided by venous return, atrial pump activity and ventricular compliance. Let us study details about venous return first. Venous return is the amount of blood that returns to the right atrium from systemic circulation and this depends on various factors like skeletal muscle pump, thoracic pump, abdominal pump, extracellular fluid volume and mean systemic filling pressure, sympathetic activity, right atrial pressure and resistance to venous return. Please remember at this point that brief explanation of each of these factors is essential part of your answer on regulation of cardiac output. Let us see all these factors one by one starting with skeletal muscle pump. So what is this pump? Whenever skeletal muscles contract especially that of lower extremity, veins running between them get compressed and blood is pushed forward towards the heart. This increases venous return and hence end diastolic volume leading to increase in the contractility, stroke volume and cardiac output. Valves in the venous system prevents backflow of blood during muscle relaxation. This mechanism plays important role in maintaining cardiac output when person is in upright posture and contracts leg muscles. But if the person is standstill for long duration, then due to lack of muscle pump activity, there are higher chances of fainting due to reduction in venous return as blood accumulates in the legs because of gravity. Next is thoracic pump. During inspiration, 
chest expands and intrathoracic pressure becomes more negative this also leads to expansion of great veins in the thorax and decreases central venous pressure it acts like suction force and facilitates venous return the mechanism of abdominal pump is as follows during inspiration as diaphragm descends intra abdominal pressure rises this causes compression of abdominal veins and pushes blood towards heart leading to increase in venous return so both thoracic as well as abdominal pump works simultaneously during respiration causing venous return to increase during inspiration and decrease during expiration next factor affecting venous return is extracellular fluid volume especially blood volume blood volume determines mean systemic filling pressure which is the pressure in the systemic circulation when the entire circulation stops its normal value is 7 mm of mercury this is the pressure that causes forward movement of the blood towards the heart whenever extracellular fluid volume or blood volume decreases say as in case of dehydration due to severe diarrhea or vomiting burns or loss of blood due to accidents or surgery mean systemic filling pressure decreases leading to decrease in venous return in contrast any condition that increases extracellular fluid volume increases venous return and thereby cardiac output for example during pregnancy extracellular fluid volume increases due to fluid retention whereas in case of sympathetic stimulation venoconstriction increases circulating blood volume leading to increase in main systemic filling pressure and hence venous return the next factor that affects venous return is right atrial pressure right atrial pressure is also called as central venous pressure it exerts backward pressure on the veins and hence increase in right atrial pressure impedes venous return its normal value is 0 mm of mercury this venous return curve shows relationship between right atrial pressure and venous return normal right atrial pressure is 0 mm of mercury and at this pressure venous return is 5 liters per minute if the pumping capability of ventricles is diminished right atrial pressure rises and offers more resistance to venous return as a result venous return falls gradually as indicated by this down slope decrease in venous return also leads to decrease in cardiac output because heart pumps the same volume of blood which it receives when right atrial pressure becomes equal to mean systemic filling pressure which is 7 mm of mercury venous return becomes zero and the entire circulation stops in contrast when right atrial pressure becomes negative there is very little increase in the venous return and at minus 2 mm of mercury venous return curve reaches plateau so further decrease in the right atrial pressure does not elevate venous return because at this level right atrial pressure creates suction force which collapses all the veins entering the thorax and hence there is no further increase in the venous return obstruction to large veins increases resistance to venous return and decreases venous return as the veins are highly distensible blood accumulates in the veins without much rise in the venous pressure and hence it reduces venous return similarly sudden sympathetic inactivity leads to veno dilation and blood gets pulled in the venous system this also reduces mean systemic filling pressure and hence the venous return normally about 2/3 of the resistance to venous return is determined by venous resistance and 1/3 by arteriolar resistance and this is due to their difference in the compliance now coming to the second factor that regulates preload atrial pump activity as we have studied in cardiac cycle atrial contraction causes about 20% filling of the ventricles any factor which increases this atrial pump activity increases the ventricular filling and end diastolic volume for example during exercise 
sympathetic stimulation to the atrial muscles increases their force of contraction and hence the end diastolic volume third factor affecting preload and hence the stroke volume is ventricular compliance or stretchability myocardial infarction cardiomyopathies or infiltrative heart diseases reduce ventricular compliance and hence the cardiac output in case of pericardial effusion or pericarditis even though ventricular muscles are normal external pressure on them restrict their stretchability and decreases end diastolic volume thus decrease in the ventricular compliance reduces end diastolic volume leading to decrease in stroke volume and hence the cardiac output as many factors regulate preload let us see them at a glance preload is determined by venous return activity of atrial pump and ventricular compliance venous return is decided by activity of skeletal muscle pump thoracic pump abdominal pump and sympathetic nervous system it is also decided by extracellular fluid volume right atrial pressure and resistance to venous return thus all these factors which regulate preload and ultimately the cardiac output are the part of heteromeric regulation so here we finish the first and the major part of stroke volume regulation preload now let us study the second factor that determines stroke volume which is myocardial contractility myocardial contractility is the ability of ventricular muscles to contract at the given end diastolic volume more the contractility more is the stroke volume same is shown here in this graph basically each of these lines represent length tension relationship in the ventricular muscles under the various conditions as undergraduate student you can just remember that factors which increase ventricular contractility shift the curve upwards and to the left these factors are said to exert positive inotropic effect so positive inotropic effect means there is increase in the force of contraction of the ventricles in contrast factors which decrease contractility are said to exert negative inotropic effect and they shift the curve downwards and right myocardial contractility is determined by ventricular muscle mass state of autonomic activity various hormones and chemical concentrations in the blood drugs and heart rate so let's study them in detail ventricular muscle mass is a simple factor to understand more the muscle mass more is the force of contraction and hence the stroke volume normally it doesn't change but regular physical exercise or athletic training leads to ventricular hypertrophy which increases stroke volume it helps them to increase stroke volume rather than the heart rate during exercise so that they can exercise for longer duration than the untrained persons in case of myocardial infarction or cardiomyopathies ventricular muscle mass is reduced leading to decrease in the stroke volume and cardiac output now coming to the role of autonomic activity ventricles are innervated mainly by sympathetic nerves but very sparsely by parasympathetic that is vagal fibers so ventricular contractility is predominantly influenced by sympathetic activity but not much by parasympathetic sympathetic stimulation as during exercise or excitement increases ventricular contractility by releasing norepinephrine which stimulates beta 1 receptors sympathetic inhibition decreases the contractility next is role of hormones catecholamines like epinephrine and norepinephrine act on beta 1 receptors they increase the ventricular contractility by increasing cyclic amp second messenger system which in turn increases intracellular calcium ion concentration thyroid hormones not only stimulate beta 1 receptors but also increase their sensitivity they also increase myosin atps activity leading to increase in myocardial contractility glucagon acts via cyclic amp and increases force of ventricular contraction it is often used as cardiotonic agent to improve stroke volume 
Insulin exhibits positive inotropic effect by increasing intracellular calcium concentration. Acetylcholine decreases myocardial contractility by acting on muscarinic receptors and decreasing cyclic AMP concentration. Chemicals like xanthins, which are present in tea and coffee, increase intracellular calcium levels by inhibiting breakdown of cyclic AMP and thus they improve force of contraction of ventricles. In contrast, hypercapnia, hypoxia, acidosis, general anesthetic agents and toxins reduce myocardial contractility. Drugs like digitalis increase ventricular contractility by inhibiting sodium potassium pump activity. As you can see in this picture, this is sodium potassium pump. So, digitalis prevents this pump from working. As a result, sodium gradient is reduced and it decreases the activity of sodium calcium exchanger leading to increased availability of calcium for muscle contraction. Drugs like barbiturate have negative inotropic effect. The last factor affecting myocardial contractility is heart rate and rhythm. For example, within physiological limits, increase in heart rate increases force of contraction according to the force frequency relationship. Also, presence of extrasystoles are associated with increase in the force of contraction. So, these effects are relatively small and are due to accumulation of calcium in the muscle fibers. Here we finish with the role of myocardial contractility in regulation of stroke volume. Now, the last factor that regulates stroke volume is afterload. Afterload is the force against which ventricular fibers shorten or in simple words it is the force that resists ejection of blood from the ventricles. Peripheral resistance which decides the diastolic blood pressure acts as afterload and the stroke volume is inversely related to afterload that is more the afterload less is the stroke volume. We can easily understand by this diagram this is the left ventricle during contraction, it ejects blood into the aorta. So, if peripheral resistance is higher, diastolic blood pressure will be more. So, ventricles have to create stronger contraction to open this aortic valve so that blood can be ejected into the aorta. Now, since afterload alters the cardiac output without changing ventricular muscle fiber length, it is also called as homometric regulation. This was first described by the scientist Arnep in 1974 and hence it is also referred as Arnep effect. Vessel diameter and the viscosity of blood are the two major factors that decide afterload. More the arteriolar diameter, less is the peripheral resistance and more is the stroke volume. If the viscosity of the blood is high, peripheral resistance is also high and it reduces stroke volume. So, now we finish with the factors regulating stroke volume. So, let us have a quick recap of all these factors. Stroke volume is determined by preload, myocardial contractility and afterload. We have already recapped factors affecting preload. So, I am not repeating them again. Myocardial contractility is determined by ventricular muscle mass, autonomic activity, hormones like catecholamines, thyroxine, glucagon, insulin, chemicals like hydrogen ions, carbon dioxide and oxygen levels, then the drugs like digitalis and barbiturates and heart rate. When contractility is higher, stroke volume and hence the cardiac output is also higher. Next factor that determines stroke volume is afterload. It is determined by peripheral resistance. Important factors regulating peripheral resistance are vessel diameter and viscosity of the blood. More the afterload, less is the stroke volume, less is the cardiac output. Regulation of cardiac output via afterload is also called as homometric regulation. So, here we finish with the factors regulating stroke volume. And let us now study the factors regulating heart rate. These factors are grouped under neural regulation and chemical regulation. First is neural regulation. We already know that heart rate is determined by rate of impulse generation by SA node. SA node is innervated by both sympathetic as well as parasympathetic that is vagal fibers. 
sympathetic stimulation increases heart rate which is called as positive chronotropic effect but to increase cardiac output there should be proportionate increase in venous return as well in case of severe tachycardia there is more decrease in the diastolic duration leading to less ventricular feeling and a end diastolic volume in such conditions either cardiac output is not altered or may decrease so whether cardiac output will be increased remain same or decreased with respect to changes in the heart rate will be decided by how much is the change in the heart rate and whether it is associated with changes in the venous return parasympathetic stimulation decreases heart rate then stimulation of baroreceptors and j receptors decrease heart rate whereas stimulation of chemoreceptors and atrial stretch receptors increase heart rate heart rate increases during inspiration and decreases during expiration it is called as sinus arrhythmia and whenever heart rate increases cardiac output also increases now coming to the chemical regulation of heart rate catecholamines thyroid hormones hypercapnia and acidosis increase heart rate whereas acetylcholine and hypoxia decrease heart rate and hence the cardiac output so here we finish with the regulation of cardiac output if you see the different books you will find different ways to discuss regulation of cardiac output so let us quickly understand the other way also that explains regulation of cardiac output now this is the summary slide of the current video indicating that cardiac output is regulated by regulating stroke volume and heart rate now according to some authors cardiac output regulation is by two ways intrinsic regulation and extrinsic regulation intrinsic regulation includes frank starling's mechanism that is regulation of preload and rate induced regulation that is regulation through heart rate via force frequency regulation extrinsic regulation includes regulation of afterload neural regulation and hormonal regulation so whichever system you follow ultimately you need to write about all these factors for regulation of cardiac output answer so that's the end of this session thank you and keep watching if you enjoy my presentations press the like button and share it with your friends for more such videos subscribe my channel and click the bell icon thank you for watching and see you in the next video